Mrs. Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am joined by an old friend of mine, Ronaldo Lawrence. Ronaldo, hello, how are you? I am extremely well, thank you. Less Ronaldo, less... can I um, ask you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everyone what you do today? Sure, I'm, um, I'm an educator. Um, I work at Glenn School uh, in Epsom. Um, I'm an Adobe educational leader, a Microsoft innovator, teacher developer. Um, I'm also a uh, Apple Distinguished Educator, and I'm fortunate enough, man, to have written two books. Um, one is a self-help book and one is a comic book, um, because I didn't see many people that look like me in comic books, so I created my own comic book. All right. Well, I'd love to see the comic book, because I know I know your book, I Am More Than What You See, and uh, I haven't got a copy, so I need to I need to sort that out. So I'm going to sort that out as soon as we finish today. Uh, but you're right about role models, so I would like to talk about mm. diversity and racism and of course, ed tech with you. Um, yeah. What I'd like to do, Ronaldo, I like to unpick the backstory. Uh, now I know you you have a ba uh, basketball history. Maybe our listeners don't. Your MBA kind of scholarship career uh, over in the yeah. states. Could could you rewind to maybe? Um, can I get you to describe your sixteen year old self first of all? Yeah, my sixteen year old self was just coming into himself. Uh, my sixteen year old self was a person who was not that confident. Um, I, my feet grew before my body did. So I was picked on a lot. Okay. Right. Um, my hands were much bigger than the average person's hands. I was picked on a lot. Yeah. Um, but my, my, I think the thing that I would say to my 16 year old self, if I had to know is that everything is going to be okay. And those lessons were, you, you know, the lessons that you learned then would prove to be invaluable today. Um, mm -hmm. But I, um, in high school, man, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. And I played at Appalachian State University. I played with a guy before I went to App at Le uh, Lancaster, Glenn DeHart. Mm -hmm. And I played for a Hall of Fame coach, Bobby Crimmins at Appalachian. Um, and then I did the NBA thing. And when I got cut, I came overseas. So I played in various countries. I played in Finland, Argentina, Sweden, Russia. Mm -hmm. A lot of places, man. And one of the things that I'm very pleased with, with all of that is that I still have friends in all those places. I go to Finland, you know, before the pandemic, once every mm -hmm. two years, I have a dear friend there. Um, yeah, man. And so I came over here, played basketball, uh, ended up being the, I think it's the fourth leading scorer in the history of British basketball, 73 points in the game. I um, 73 points in a single game. Mm -hmm. um, I hold various records. And I was very fortunate enough to be blessed with a son who played in the Olympics played for, in the Olympics for Great Britain basketball. And I'm doubly blessed because I've got a daughter who's a social media manager at Vogue Business. Uh, yeah. You know, so I, I'm, I'm really blessed and I've got a wife. Now I've, been doing my, I've been doing my research and uh, I, I, I love the father comment that you've written in a blog that I've discovered where you didn't want to give your advice to your son and daughter. You kept quiet. Mm -hmm. but they now come to you for advice. So uh, what kind of things do they come to you for that bit, uh, pearls of wisdom? Well, I think a, a lot of it, man, is, you know, I remember me growing up and me not wanting to listen to my mom or dad at all because I thought I was grown, you know. So, um, but I think uh, my grandmother always says something to me. Um, she said to me once, when you have kids, be quiet mm -hmm. and you'll be surprised at the right age they'll come to you. Uh, my son played basketball, man, and, um, you know, I used to give him advice and try to push him to do things or whatever, and I just shut up. I just shut up, and I just watched. And <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden, man, one day he just came and he just asked me my advice, man. I almost fell off the chair, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, it's been like that since. And I, I think one of the, the most amazing things that I've got in my life is my relationship with my children, um, mm -hmm. because I, I think... You know, I was fortunate enough to have parents who cared enough about me. And, and I had a grandmother and grandfather who I just absolutely adored. And, and you know, it's usually funny enough, the way you were raised is how you parent, you mm -hmm. know. And so I, I, I was blessed enough to, to be parented, I think, quite well. Um, I had my moments, though, but they wanted to kill me. I had my moments. <laughs> oh, so, we all do. At yeah. what point did the teaching conversation happen, Ronaldo? When, when did that happen? Um, well, I had my degree in the States. Um, I was a teacher in the, well, I was, I had my degree in the States, but I never taught in the States. I did some substitute teaching. Uh -huh. um, but I went straight to Finland. Uh, once I got cut, I went straight to Finland, spent two years in Finland, in Oulu, and in um, Silo, a place close to Helsinki. 
And then after that, I went to the various other countries, but I always had my degree. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I used to do, because I'm just interested in people, and I'm interested in how systems work. So when I was in Finland, I spent a large part of my day in schools, watching how schools work and teaching basketball camps. Um, because I always knew that I wanted to be, you know, something to do with education. Um, but I just never thought that I would actually be a teacher per se, you mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah, but that, that, that's where the education bit came in. And, um, I, when I came here, I, um, I met my wife. Um, and I always like to say, man, she turned me down three times, you know, All right, okay. pride and joy. She turned me down three times, <laughs> um, but I've been with her for God knows how long now, which has been amazing. Um, but I started teaching here and I started teaching Ross. It was quite crazy because I started teaching just on a whim. Um, we had a, a young lady, Alina Gullenberska, who was playing basketball with my wife and she, and she, there was a young lady who was there, who was pregnant, who needed to go off. And so she just said, would Ronaldo like a job? Mm. I had a degree, so I went in originally for six weeks, and that six weeks ended up being twelve years. And um, you're and an I, you're an uh, IT teacher, yeah, ICT. Yeah, I was PE. I was I was a PE teacher. Okay. I was a PE teacher, and um, I then was in a room one day, and um, this guy Glenn Cole, he, he's passed away, God bless his soul, and he um, he had Microsoft Word open, but then he had another program called Photo Draw. And he dragged an image from Photo Draw into Microsoft Word, and I fell off my chair. I was hooked. I remember it well. I was hooked. Yeah, I was hooked. <laughs> Photo Draw. Yeah. Yeah, I um, was hooked. And and I know you worked at Chiswick School because I have done. Yes. I have been that way. So that's going back a few years. So, uh, do, you know, just maybe describe that kind of part of your twelve-year journey. You know, teaching at least in London. You know, things you've so, done. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I'm most proud of, I used to teach at the Great Court Hospital School, um, and we had a head mistress who raised over 10 million pounds herself, man. Mm -hmm. um, and the Queen and Duke opened up the building, um, opened up the school, and we were fortunate enough to meet the Duke, meet the Queen, um, and everything um, because of the uh, athletic prowess of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, and I left there because my son was born. And then I, um, I went to Chiswick and Chiswick was interesting, man. Chiswick was interesting because um, I had previously at Great Coat only taught girls. Um, and then I went to St. John the Baptist School and I taught uh, boys and girls. So it was, it was a big difference. And then I went to Chiswick School. And then Chiswick was, was very interesting because at the time Chiswick was, you know, London schools, not all of them, so I'm not painting a brush, but this particular school at the time, they obviously had some issues with behavior and whatever. Um, but I was very fortunate, man, because very seldom did I have any issues with behavior. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, um, I think, first of all, how you treat people. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that other teachers didn't treat people well, but I also think of my statue. But also when the kids found out that I played basketball and I was American, then all of a sudden you don't have to say much. Yeah, you know, you, bet, and, it's, yeah. And, you know it's the same. When my son went to the States, he, when they found out that he was English, he didn't have to say much. Matter of fact, they wanted him to talk because they loved well, the way he's. You know, some of the schools I've worked in, Ronaldo. You know, if I, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Greg City Academy in Tottenham. You know, the vast majority of the student population there, you know, black Caribbean, black African kids who absolutely love basketball and. Yeah. You know, yes. having those role models, you know, our basketball club was incredibly popular, but, you know, having those connections in class and with sport, we know is really important. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to move it forward. We met in 2011 at SL yeah. Teach Me. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. Yes, sir, I do. Could, yep, could I you do. maybe uh, describe some of the memories of, you know, what the event was, why you were there? Well, I was there because, um, as I said, man, I had just gotten into IT and I had not a clue what was going on in terms of IT. I had no idea. And so what I did was um, I was fortunate enough that the school let me out this one particular time. Yeah. Um, what I did before that, before I came there, is I asked all the teachers in my school, because the young lady, Susie Ralph, who was there, she was pregnant and she told me that she was going off um, in a certain amount of time. So mm -hmm. I said that if you want the job, it's going to come up. So if you want the job, well, it's up to you. So I asked every single teacher or every single department in that school, if they had an intranet site or a website, what would they do? What would they have on it? So they gave me the materials. 
Now, yeah. Ross, this is not a word of lie. I had no idea what I was going to do. <laughs> not a clue. And um, so what I did, man, was in the times when the library used to be open on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah. So I used to go to the library all the time. And so I went to that teach meet in order to sort of get a, a broad perspective about what was going on in IT. Mm. And I think I came away a little more confused than I, I was before I went. <laughs> uh, you know, because, you know, there was all these people trying to sell things. And, and, and you know, so it was, it was interesting. It was interesting. It was interesting. Yeah, and I mean, that, that, that SL Teach Me, it was designed, it was an event, as you know, through Twitter, you know, Teach Me is quite yeah. common practice now, but it was a one, I guess, that I had uh, organized with Stephen Lockyer, you'll remember, yeah. um, for school leaders explicitly, rather than, I guess, classroom teachers or like yourself, struggling right. in a particular uh, subject or a classroom uh, you'd be pleased to know that today i'm sure you've been to one or two yourself now there's very uh, dedicated subject ones that will help teachers yes. that need yes. that so um yeah i guess that the question is how did you survive in those earlier years well i think i survived through pure ignorance and i think i also survived through just and i'm the same way now after all these years man i just you know, I eat and breathe the computer. I eat and breathe the camera. I eat and breathe the ability to help somebody else. I eat and breathe yeah. the opportunity to get up in the morning and just create digital content that somebody else can can learn. Now, I'm going to interject on this one here, listeners. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're not following Ronaldo on Twitter or, or Instagram or wherever, every other day, you know, if not every day, you post every a little day. motivational video and the now, when you come across them, you do make people feel good. I, I can vouch for that, Ronaldo. You do make me motivated. So thank you, and please oh, thank uh, you. keep that. What was your message for today? I haven't done it today. Um, <laughs> I never, I never, it comes to me, oh, yeah. um, and it just comes to me. And when it comes, I know it's the right one to put out. Um, yeah. There'll be one later on. Yeah, but sometimes right. it happens in the morning. Sometimes it happens midday. Yeah. I don't. All right, when it when it when it comes, when you, you enjoy the flow, just like a good basketballer. Uh, now I want to switch the conversation to something really important. I want to have that conversation about diversity and racism. Yes. Um, you know, you know, white man. You know, the conversation for me, I think working in London significantly helped me. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm back in. A, I wouldn't say my homeland, but now I'm back living up north. Uh, you know, it's a quite a diverse area where I live, but definitely not as diverse as living in London. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember my own thoughts about the exposure to diversity when I first moved when I was 19 years old, uh, teacher training uh, in the early 90s. And I do thank teaching for broadening my lens. And I guess it's that education word that matters more than anything, doesn't yeah. it? And uh, mm -hmm. as we record this, we're talking about um, a little kind of Palestine, you know, the, the, the kind of conflict in Palestine and Israel yeah. at the moment uh, and a little event that happened on our London streets, you know, all yeah. about, you know, misunderstanding or conflicts. Can I just get um, your general thoughts on where we are today, Ronaldo, what your hopes are for the future and things that we can do in our schools? Well, I, I think there is still a long way to go. Um, I, I think the problem... I believe personally, I believe that part of the problem is all of a sudden, if you've never been around people and it cannot be your fault, but if you've never been around a group of people, um, all different, all people are different. And when you, when you have a group of people who are different, um, ethnicity to you, it is, it is sort of different when you, you know, some of the things that they do, even, even me here, when I first got here and I dealt with some uh, Caribbean individuals, you know, that was different from what I was used to. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think we're in a place now, man, where I just think we need to listen to each other. Um, I just think we need to be heard and people just want to be heard. You know, I think, you know, that thing that happened to George Floyd was, was just, it was awful. Mm -hmm. um, but like his daughter said, man, he changed the world. He changed the world yeah, because yeah. now all of a sudden people who didn't want to talk are now talking. Mm. People who were scared to talk are now talking. And as a black individual, I don't care how much I would march. I don't care what I would say. If there's no white individuals involved, then nothing happens. Mm. Because and I think that's it. It's important to talk about it, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you look at what happened at the riot at the white, uh, you know, at the house in, in America. If mm. that was were black people, they would have slaughtered them, you know? Mm. 
Absolutely. Yet a lot of those people are getting off, you know, and it's that it is that white privilege that people really don't understand that truly exists, mm -hmm. that truly, truly exists. It, it, it does. And we have, we have to acknowledge that. And I, I think, you know, I'd like to kind of maybe unpick what are your kind of hopes, um, you know, not necessarily broadly, but are there specific things that schools, teachers can can do in their classrooms? Yeah, I think, number one, um, I, I think that the first thing, and, and please remind me at the end, because I'd like to tell you a site that I've created okay. uh, with a young lady in the States. But I think, man, one of the things that we can do, instead of just teaching white history, why don't you teach all history? Mm -hmm. Uh, why don't you teach some of the truth? Because a lot of the history that was written was written for the white man, and a lot of it is lies. Um, I don't think a lot of kids have actually um, heard about, you know, the Tulsa, when, when the, the city that was in Tulsa. And they just, uh, they had all the black bankers, all the black lawyers, all the black people were prominent people. And all of a sudden, you know, this group of white, they just ran and just killed all those people and, and, um, looted the place and just destroyed the place. As a matter of fact, LeBron James on the 30, he and Maverick Carter, I think it's on the 30th of this mm -hmm. month, comes out with the uh, Netflix drama about it. Right, okay. I think it's so, important to tell stories. So on the first point, I guess, uh, you know, what do you think needs to happen in the curriculum? You know, a, a more diverse curriculum uh, yeah. explicitly in history or in all subjects? I think in all subjects. I, th I, think th I think that's the problem. And I think that's the problem in general with education, man. I think because what happens with education is everything is separate. The kids don't see any kind of connection, you know. And I remember a time when I was here and we were teaching, whereas if I was teaching IT, someone in history did something and then they would, and they would come to me and then they would turn it into a multimedia, you know, so there was sort of some kind of connection around. Yeah, everything. And, I mean, and if we even pick up on the IT, you know, I've taught computer science in my um, time as a teacher. And you now if you put me in a corner, right, let's unpick the diversity behind the curriculum choices, who designed what components yeah. that would make for an interesting conversation in IT alone, I think. Um, could you give us a second tip? You know, talk, having this conversation, talking about curriculum and telling stories, what would be your second piece of advice for teachers? I think the second thing, man, is to find out about the kids. Um, because one of the things that I do every single year, be it black, blue, purple, or green, is when those kids walk into my classroom, man, I want to know something about them as people. I don't even look at the curriculum in the first week. The first mm -hmm. week is spent with them talking to me about who they are, me finding out what instruments they play if they play in a band, what church they go to, me trying to find out things about them. Because believe it or not, a lot of those kids, man, I'm the only black person that they will deal with on a consistent basis in their young lives. Yeah, I can believe it. I can believe yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you give me a tip for school leaders, Ronaldo? What would you advise uh, those people, dare I say, white men at the top, to I think more broadly or strategically about making a making a commitment or a change to how they do things? I think one of the first things, man, is um, if you need to try to find some people that look like some of these kids. Because I don't care who you are. You know, you want to see people that look like you. Mm -hmm. And you want to see people that you can emulate that looks like you. I think the second thing is, on top, that you actually have to make a concerted effort to have a curriculum that is broad, to have a curriculum that you insist that history is being taught from a different perspective. You know, and I think also what needs to happen is possibility. You know, you have this Black History Month. I think it's amazing. But every single day should be a Black History Day. Every single day should be mm -hmm. a, a day in which you're teaching about different people from around the world, you know. Uh, and I think, you know, and it's controversial. I think one of the biggest lies, Christopher, Christopher Columbus is coming to America. No, I don't know if there's a controversial question, but I want to ask it. Yeah, ask me. I'll tell you anything. I don't care. It, it's, <laughs> is Black History Month outdated in today's world? Because I, I know don't, the schools I've I worked in, it was always a month to celebrate. And I think it's critical yeah. and important. But as you mentioned, it should be every day. How do we, is it a change in curriculum that will make that History Month celebration an outdated model? Or is it important to have specific dates such as it's National Hug Day, National Dog Day, uh, Black History Month? Are those dates just as important to at least shine a light on specific parts of our world? I think those dates are important, but 
Ross, every day that I walk in school and I look in a book, I see somebody that look like you. I don't see somebody that look like me. That's Absolutely. every day. Yeah. Why should we just say one day is going to be or one month is going to be Black History Month? I think every day needs to be taught. History needs to be taught about yeah, people. And I agree that, with you. So, do you, so uh, I guess the keeping the Black History Month is at least shining a stronger light on something that should be happening day to day already. Yes, yes, yes. And right. you know what? And I'm going to tell you something very quickly. The world is a the world is in education. If you look at what's happening in the world, you can bring any topic into the world and use that topic in order to teach kids about what you want them to teach. But people are afraid of speaking the truth. Mm. Speaking of afraid, of, uh, people are afraid. And, and I, I think, and I think it's, it's you know I, I, I'm getting braver talking about you know diversity and racism. I think you know you have to go through that pain barrier of having that uncomfortable yeah. conversation oh, yeah. uh, to a point where you're doing it on a podcast that's public uh, mm -hmm. and just encouraging others along with you. <laughs> Now, I want to switch to the pandemic uh, and Ed Tech. I, one thing. I admire you for bringing the topic up, and I thank you for bringing it up uh, because I've known you for a while, and I don't think there's a racist bone in your body, man. And I'm just, I'm very pleased that you would take the time to ask me questions like that. So I just wanted to say thank you publicly. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I'd love to talk longer, but I'm conscious of the podcast yeah, and... time ticking over also. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd talk for hours. Thank Maybe you. listeners want to hear more, so you'd love to let me know. But uh, we're in the pandemic, yep. and you're an ed tech IT specialist today. You weren't 12 years ago. Um, what lessons have you learned about the technology issues, how you've adapted personally and professionally? You know, what would you say 18 months ago to you going into the pandemic? Okay, I would say that I was prepared. I would say that all the stuff that I was doing 12 years ago, mm. leading up to that, I was prepared for it because I'm constantly learning, constantly trying to do things to, to better myself. Um, so I was sort of prepared. And I, and I think uh, what I've really, really gotten from it is that nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Nobody knows, everybody's guessing. And I think that if you want to be something in this world, you just gotta try stuff, man. Mm. You know, and if it fails, so what? At least you know not to go down that path again. But I think what I've learned from the whole thing is try stuff, do stuff. And I've also learned, man, in the classroom that Kids are the most forgiving people in the world. They are. Kids are the most forgiving people they in are. the world. Not, you make, not, it makes you human. Maybe not uh, wiser souls, on, particularly on social media with the kind of call-out culture, and that might probably make us a little bit more reserved, don't you think? I agree. Totally agree. Now, social media is a different beast unto itself. So what, what's the kind of key thing from the pandemic experience that you've learned about life, teaching, love, whatever it would be? What, what's, 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 made, what's become important to you? I would say that the first thing that will become important to me is that um, I am somebody and I've learned that I'm important and I've learned that um, I'm special. I learned that everybody in this pl on this planet is special. I've learned that I have a family who's absolutely amazing and supportive. Um, I've learned that anybody who's in authority anywhere that when the pandemic hit, you can see that everybody was guessing. So I've learned, man, just to try stuff and I could care less anymore. I'm going to try stuff. That's really good advice. Um, so what have you tried, uh, let's say, the last month that's new? Filmmaking. So I've tried. I've, I've, I've got me a um, um, camera. Is that personally or professionally for the classroom or for yourself? Uh, it's personal right now, but it's going to be professional. And I am going to – I my probably the area that I'm going to look at is headshots, where you mm -hmm. interview shots. Um, I've already been working with a guy called Tony Ryan, who's the head of uh, DT, uh, one of the organizations with DT in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to do a lot, man. So it, you know, it's, it's something that I'm really passionate about. Something I've got in the equipment. Something that I failed miserably on, but something right. I love. It. So I look forward to your movie, little videos. Now I've got one more big question for you. I suppose um, you're a wise man. You've been around the world. You've worked in lots of different environments. You know the pressures that our schools are under. What What's the one thing that you think is the most important thing you'd like to see change? I think the most important thing I would like to see change pretty much is the curriculum. I, I just think, man, that mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the biggest issues that we have is, you know, computer science is amazing. And don't get me wrong. I think computer science is so important. But not every kid is going to be a computer scientist. And I think with what's happening now with the curriculum is we're trying to force some of these kids into things that they are not ready for. And I just, just don't think that it's right for some of them. I mean, it's right for some. I think up to key stage, up, to, up to key stage three, I think it's amazing. 
I think it's amazing. But once you get to key stage four, I think then you need to then start thinking about what you're going to do. The other issue I think that I have with education is how in the heck we expect kids who are year eight to pick things that they're going to do for the rest of their life. Mm. I think that's pretty much a joke. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know who I am today. You know, <laughs> I'm still trying to find out who I am. So how you would say that I know that I want to do this particular subject for yeah. all of my school so life. are you suggesting that maybe kind of option choices exam testing might come a bit later yes that's exactly what, i'm not suggesting i'm saying that that's you're what i'm saying, saying that okay yeah. uh yeah. and so perhaps more kind of work experience type yes. apprenticeship of opportunities yeah. for our children at an earlier yeah. age to allow them to you know i i, I love my work experience at school mm -hmm. it, it al at least allowed you to explore the real world and then determine what you might like doing in the future. But um, uh, we all go through a career change at some point in our oh, lives, yes. don't we? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, mm. Now, um, we've passed the 20, well, we're 25 minutes up at least on the podcast, Ronaldo. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with my podcast, but I, I throw quick fire questions at my guests to try and catch you out. So I'm yep. going to see if I can get, get you to pause or hesitate on a yep. question and catch you out. But I'll start easy and I'll go, I'll go slow and kind for the beginning. Okay. Uh, so what, what project are you working on at the moment? What's on your desk? Creative Dimensions. I'm creating a film course of uh, what I'm doing, learning to be a filmmaker. I'm creating a course teaching people the mistakes I've made and what they can do in order to be better, along with how to get started and the equipment. Okay. What book are you reading? I'm reading my own book because I think it's a very good book. Okay. Are, are you more prolific on Twitter or Instagram? Uh, probably Twitter. If you organize your own teach meet for teachers that are new to computer science, what advice would you give yourself? I think the first thing I would do is teach them how to create content like video, um, audio files, and then so they could put it together so kids can learn on their own. Mm -hmm. What's your biggest uh, career ach achievement to date? What are you My most proud of? career achievement I'm most proud of is that I've stayed in education this long. Fantastic. What's your piece of advice for new teachers who want to get into a bit of kind of academic or education research? I think the biggest thing to do is to try to find out the area which you're interested in and then go around that avenue around mm -hmm. that path. Uh, a piece of research or someone that I need to read or follow uh, to help me understand white privilege? Uh, Oprah Winfrey. I think Oprah. she has the stuff. Oprah. Um, I think also um, that one you've got me on because I, I know a lot of books, but I just can't think of them right now. So right, well, yeah. I've, I've got you on the spot a little bit. It's a hard question. That's so we'll put some links in the blog. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, behavior. You mentioned behavior earlier. Um, you know, talking about stories, but what's what's your thing that you? How do you get kids in the palm of your hand? What well, you must have a methodology or a way of kind of wooing kids to to make them kind of uh, believe and listen to every word you say. What what's your kind of magic ingredient? I genuinely care about them and I listen to them. I let them have their voice. Okay. What's your favorite computer science piece of software in the classroom today? I don't teach computer science. I teach, uh, I use Adobe Dreamweaver. Uh, I use Adobe Premiere, all that stuff. I'm on the creative side. Okay. Fantastic. Um, what's your favorite app on your iPhone? Favorite app on my iPhone probably is my camera because I get an opportunity to send videos to my mom who's 95 years old with dementia and then she can always play them back. Right, fantastic. What's uh, what do you do to relax? I get on my computer, man. <laughs> I, get on my computer <laughs> man. I, do, I do film stuff. <laughs> I just do that. Uh, reminders um, of your two book titles. Okay, so it's I Am More Than What You See, and then there's the comic book, A Boy Get Off My Pig, but there's also a website, which is um, OurStoryBeyondBooks.com, which is a website that we've created mm -hmm. in order to... Uh, promote people of all all races of everything mm -hmm. you know we have a lot of stuff on there mm -hmm. i love to check out that cartoon book and then what would be your advice for a teacher who wants to write their book what what advice would you give i think the thing is um well let me put it like this i think the mistake is that if you don't write the book i think if you spent the time in order to live any any part of life on this planet i think you have a story to tell and i think it's very important that you tell your story because if you help one person mm-hmm now, last question, uh, Ronaldo, uh, what do you hope to be your legacy? My legacy, man, that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book so I would always be on this planet. I wrote the comic books, so I would always be on the planet. But I think my legacy, man, if, if I was to die tomorrow, I think the one thing that I would want somebody to say is that when I met him, he treated me like a human being. 
Fantastic. So there you go, folks. Uh, Ronaldo Lawrence. Ronaldo, when we get out of this lockdown craziness and I'm back in town, we're going to hook up for a coffee and have a good old... We're going to have a hug, first of all. <laughs> and then we'll have a good chat about uh, racism and diversity. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Listeners, uh, tune into the podcast. Uh, you're listening to Teacher Toolkit. Uh, speak to you again soon. Thanks for listening. Cheers, Ronaldo. That's brilliant. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, really good fun.